25 Minecraft speedrunner tips to save your time. If anyone knows how to play Minecraft, it's the speedrunning community. So today, we've gathered up the biggest brain plays and tactics to help you get wicked fast at survival. And hey, it turns out that Mr. Hank from Wyoming has the world record for subscribing to the channel at two and a half seconds. So if you want to beat his time, get ready, set, and go for that subscribe button down below. It's free, and it helps out a ton. But first, do you want to see me get the world record in the speedrunning and ad read category? Well, good, because this video is sponsored by Keeps. As you can see, this creeper is bald. And while you might think it's always been this way, that's just not true. There was once a time where he had a flowing mane of gorgeous locks. Nice. Until, of course, I installed the male pattern baldness mod and all that charm washed away. And that's not just a problem for creepers, because two out of three guys will experience some kind of male pattern baldness by the age of 35. So, to do something while he still had a bit of hair left, Mr. Creeper went to Keeps, where they offer the only two FDA-approved hair loss products for a price that you've never seen before. That way, he could prevent his hair loss without having to spend those hard-earned diamonds. Which is good, because the sooner that you start using keeps, the more hair you'll save. Prevention is key when it's talking about hair loss. So if you notice that you're losing hair, do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com slash skip, or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. Thanks, keeps. Number one. When you first boot up your world, many of us probably have on our to-do list first thing is to get wood. But as you're going about taking that task off your list, what you might not know is that you're actually blowing some killer time here when you could just do the bare minimum. You see, to get all the basic necessities you need, a couple of sticks and a wooden pickaxe for stone, all you need is about three to four logs at the start of the world. Seriously, everything past that is brownie points. An easy way to visualize it is that you only have to take down the blocks within an immediate radius of you. Past that, you got everything you need to get started and you can head on with the rest of the run. Number two. Now this is a step that I think a lot of us leave for later on during the game, but actually doing it first thing on the world is a pretty good idea to get out of the way. You see, getting flint is something of a luxury, allowing for flint and steels as well as arrows for the ender dragon fight. So when you're running past all those rivers early on, then why not just sink down to the bottom and take up a couple pieces before you leave? That way you've got a key resource early on, and you really don't need to divert from the path when it's really not all that opportune. Number 3. Using beds to take down the ender dragon is a fairly common strategy nowadays. And rightfully so, it does a ton of damage. But depending on where you spawn and the luck that you happen to have, it might not be always in your path to go and find some sheep. So in that case, a huge way to beef up your arsenal is to get beds from the villages that you pass through. Finding a village is already a huge time save, so if you manage to come across one, then why not also use it to save yourself time in the fight? Besides, if you're doing a true speedrun, you don't have to worry about taking the beds from these villagers and having to deal with them later. You can just leave them be and beat the game. That seems like intentional game design to me. Number 4. It cannot be overstated how helpful villages can be in your Minecraft run. But even amongst the villagers, there is somewhat of a hierarchy. Because if you're really trying to be particular, then looking for a plain savanna or desert village can be a huge help early game. The reason being is that those particular ones spawn with hay bales, which can give you a huge dose of food and save you time when you don't have to go running off for a grocery run. That's why random seed speedrunners will constantly re-roll for one of these. They're just so much help and they really turn the tides of your game. Number five. While mostly everything from villages is helpful, there is somewhat of a double-edged sword in some of these. And that's gotta be this big hunk. You see, if you manage to kill one, then you can net yourself some early iron and save yourself a couple phases of the run. But don't let the speed get the better of you, because if you manage to make that tower just a little bit too short or give them some form of a leg up, then they are going to use it to their advantage and take what could have been a great run and throw it right into the dirt. So take your time to make sure you get this assassination right, and I promise it'll pay off in the rewards you get 100%. Number 6. If you've been lucky enough to score some early game flint and iron, but you haven't been able to get so much in the food department, then making a flint and steel and going animal hunting is a great idea. Not only is this pretty fun as a pastime, but also it can give you some really high nutrition food. Which, since we're not getting much armor when we're moving quickly, that really can help to regen in some critical moments. So stitch together that flint and iron, find your pack of animals, and get ready to thank Prometheus for bringing fire to us humans. Number 7. And after you've kitted yourself out with whatever you've managed to find, the next thing that you might want to look for is a desert. This can wind up being a huge help, and no, not just for those glass windows, but also for finding a desert temple. If you manage to pull off one of these, then you can get really high level loot early on in the game. While sure, there is plenty of RNG going on within these four chests, there is enough loot that can happen here to make this worth your while if you find one. And it might just give you the rares and resources to shave hours off your run to the Ender Dragon. 
Number 8. Desert temples aren't just worth your while for the resources you'll find in the treasure, but also for the traps that lie beneath. If you manage to find one of these and yank the explosives out of the rigging, then what you can do is mix this with a village and get some really great resources and blocks by just blowing up the villagers' houses. And sure, this might not look great for your criminal record, but by setting some of these off, you're gonna get some really great resources of cobble, wooden, stone, planks, and all that without having to break any of the blocks yourself. Although, if you go this route, just make sure to use a button to light it off instead of a flint and steel. Otherwise, you run the risk of lowering your trades with villagers, or worse, getting attacked by an iron golem that's not too happy. Number 9. This is a technique that I'm guilty of using constantly in all of my runs. And for good reason, it can save a lot of time and a lot of headaches. If you manage to find a village that generates with a cleric, then what you can do is work your way through the emerald market and get yourself some early game ender pearls. Partner this with the absurd amount of cash that you can get from other professions such as the Fletcher's stick trade, and this can be a pretty easy option to get all of your ender pearls without even having to look at an enderman. And since the village and pillage update gave us all the resources necessary to change these guys' jobs at will, if you've got a spare blaze rod or the flint for a fletching table, then this is definitely a great route to go on. Number 10. Getting the obsidian necessary for another portal is not a fun time, and it takes a lot of it at that. So if you don't get absurdly lucky with the obsidian from blacksmith chests and you're not looking to get all the diamonds necessary for a pickaxe, then you better get well and familiar with the bucket portal. By scoping out a lava link, usually above ground, you're able to mix the water and lava that you get in buckets to really make the perfect ring to get yourself right over to the next dimension. And while the structure to make this might seem pretty easy, it's deceptively simple, especially if you want to get pretty fast at it. So if you're looking to take the easy way out and you've got plenty of luck on your side, then you can repair a nether portal ruin from the 1.16 update and get there the same way. This can definitely cut down on the learning curve, but just make sure that there's no crying obsidian blocks hiding in your structure, otherwise the portal's just not gonna light up. Throwing all that time you would have saved right over to the curve. Number 12. As soon as you step foot through that nether dimension, you gotta understand that here the economies run on gold. So, if you didn't pick up much of that in the overworld before, what you can do is scope out for nether gold lying around you. Granted, it's not as good as a return, especially if you don't have a silk touch pickaxe, but really, it might just give you enough of the yellow stuff to get on your way. And trust me, any of those ingots that you manage to scavenger up can go miles if you get on the piglin's good side. But you aren't doing that dress as the bum that you are, so how about crafting a pair of golden boots to get on their good side as soon as possible? Putting your nether gold into some of these can be a great early investment, especially because the piglin are great allies to have. And besides, all the different items that you're able to net from these guys really justifies having the boots in your wardrobe. Especially because as a 1.16, if you manage to throw out enough gold ingots to these guys, you can get all of the ender pearls that you need for your run. Granted, we are dealing with the dreaded RNG gods once again, but as soon as you manage to get the ender pearls from these guys, it can really turn around and run. Because, let me be honest, I don't like the odds of getting an ender pearl any more than you do. But if it comes down to making it rain on Porky Pig over here, or going back over to the overworld to fight off endermen, yeah, I'm definitely taking my chances with the pigs. Number 15. Finding a fortress in the nether is the name of the game, but if you've already used up all your luck and now you're trying to find one of these structures off in the distance, what might be a good idea is to follow the lead of Hansel and Gretel and set up a breadcrumb trail of easy to mine blocks on your way to the new structure. That way, if you mess up and you need to change your direction, it's a lot easier to mine of sand than it is obsidian. And taking the extra seconds to lay out that yellow brick road can save you potential hours when you try to get back through your portal. Number 16. When you reach another fortress, it might be easy to just grab the first blaze spawner that you see. But by doing that, you might take a short-term victory that hurts you in the long term. You see, if you can't, manage to find a blaze spawner that's surrounded by blocks, because that way it's so much easier. Because keep in mind, these mobs can fly, and I don't think any of us are looking at wasting our time or arrows to try and get a couple of blaze rods from the sky. So what I'm saying is, if you're looking for your blaze endeavors to go quick, you might want to find a hard top instead of a convertible roof. Number 17. If you're anything like me, then hunting blazes is a pain in the brain. So let's not draw out the headache and just get an exact number of 8 blaze rods to get out of there. With this amount, you get the best odds for your buck. Because there, we get 6 blaze rods to make 12 eyes for the portal if there's none already in, and then plus an extra 2 for 4 backup eyes if any of them happen to break on the way there. While this isn't the most minimalist you can possibly play, I feel like it gives you a good enough cushion where even if you get unlucky with the portal spawn, or the eye shattering on the way there, you're still going to be able to pull together the run, even if you get unlucky. 
Number 18. If you still don't have enough ender pearls by this point, then this is a speedrunner tactic that can be pretty helpful to game the system. What we're essentially doing here is setting up a soft reset button so that we can clean the board if we don't see the right mobs that we want to find. So to do that, we set up a pillar of 128 blocks or more, set our spawn at the top, and then jump down safely to the bottom. Then when you're down there, check what mobs spawn, hopefully an enderman, look at them, and then fight them off. Following that, it's just a simple death with dignity by lava, and then you can respawn right at the top to do the whole process over again. And by manipulating the way that the mobs unload and respawn, we can really get some sweet amount of resources with this. Number 19. Horses can be an often overlooked part of Minecraft travel, especially because later game, they definitely get surpassed. But if you manage to find a saddle during your race to the end, typically from a desert temple, then make sure to hold on to it. Because those things become extra handy if you manage to find a horse to aid you in your stronghold search. Even a mediocre steed can be loads faster than just sprint jumping to find the ender portal. And besides that, who's not on board to add a little bit of style to what basically amounts to be a low-powered metal detector? Number 20. As soon as you crack into the stronghold, it can be pretty difficult to find out where exactly the portal is. And since the eyes of Ender can only get you so far, most of us just rely to guesswork and figuring out the maze ourselves. Although, a key tactic to use that really turns this around is using Minecraft's audio subtitles in the accessibility menu. By using this feature, you no longer have to rely on just your ears, but you can also have a visual indicator as to not only what sound is playing, but exactly where it came from which can be pretty helpful if you're trying to scope out the lava or silver fish that you'll find in the stronghold, which might be all you need to find that spawner and get one step closer to beating the ender dragon. Number 21, pillaring up to destroy the end crystal towers isn't always the safest bet. Though by adding in the caged crystal towers, Mojang does try to force our hand a bit. Clearly the arrows do no good here. However, if you get right up close to one of these things and stand right next to the pillar, you can use the powers of physics and gravity to get an arrow to hit that tower just right and save yourself the trip of having to go up there and do it yourself. Number 22. Now, if you've watched any Minecraft speedrun, then I'm sure you already know that the water bucket is a huge save. So I'm not gonna harp on too much of the details here. But what I will say is that if you haven't built the water bucket by this time, you really gotta have one going into the Ender Dragon fight. By mastering this technique, you take the overpowered knockback from the Ender Dragon and completely negate it, allowing you to go right along with your deathless run and save all the time that you would have spent respawning and taking on the dragon again. Number 23. In the current meta of Minecraft speedrunning, a true Ender Dragon fight is really just a test of how much wool you prepared prior to it. Because as you can see, there is no more of a surefire way to speed up the Ender Dragon fight than by using bed explosions. And in a couple of hits from one of these when it lands at the fountain, you can just as easily end the fight right there. So put any and all wool you have into a row, take out the beds from your inventory, and absolutely destroy the dragon this way. Just make sure you don't accidentally speedrun your own life with one of these. Number 24. When Minecraft updated so that the Ender Dragon lands at the portal during the fight, the whole tone of the battle changed. Although, if sometimes you feel like your hits just aren't connecting when you try to run close to the dragon, then you can make this move really work for you by actually standing underneath the dragon inside of the fountain. By doing this, you take yourself out of harm's way and no longer have to worry about things like the dragon's breath or any knockback that you get from running too close, letting you slice and dice while your health bar stays clean and pristine. Number 25. When fighting the Ender Dragon, most of the time we just take any hits that we can get. But if you're already standing underneath it and you're trying to get a little pickier, then it is worth mentioning that aiming for the dragon's head with your melee attacks actually gets more damage done. And hey, any excuse to dispatch this dragon and get done with the fight easier is fine by me. Just make sure to keep its noggin in your sight and land those hits right up until the end of the game. And with that folks, make sure to do an any percent run to that subscribe button down below and have a good one, alright?